So thank you very much for coming today. So my name is Santiago Schnell. I'm the William K. Warren Foundation Dean of the College of Science. And I would like to welcome you today to the Science Exploration uh, Seminar Series. When people ask me uh, the question, what makes a football weekend so special and not I, I, I have to say one thing. So everyone imagines that it's excitement of the game, experiencing how uh, the getting rivalry between teams actually brings the best of our team at the University of Notre Dame, our rivals. But the reality is that there is something much more about a football weekend at the University of Notre Dame. So we hold this seminar series where we bring the classroom and the research enterprise out from the university into the football weekend. And you have the, the opportunity to experience with family and friends of what the University of Notre Dame has the best to offer, both in the classroom and in the laboratories. In the science exploration lecture series, we have a, a really wonderful number of speakers that they come in during the semester. Some of them are University uh, of Notre Dame professors, others are former alumni. And what they do is that they present groundbreaking research that can go from the mysteries of the universe, big planets and the stars, into the molecules that we have all inside of ourselves. And today, I'm very pleased of introducing Dr. James Elsa, who graduated from the University of Notre Dame in 1981 uh, with his bachelor degree in biomedical sciences. This weekend, he joins his classmates on campus in celebrating their 40th anniversary uh, of graduating from, from the university. Since March 2016, Dr. Elsa has been served as the German Professor of Ecology at the University of Montana and the director of the Flandern Lake Biolcan Station at Yellow Bay. He also holds a part-time research faculty position in the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University, where he directs the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliances. He trained in limnology, which is the study of the inland aquatic ecosystems. He's very well known uh, for his role developing and testing a theory that is called ecological stoichiometry. There is a study of how energy and multiple chemicals that are in the environment, they balance with the ecological system. He spoke about his work yesterday in a seminar or as part of our environmental change initiative in the Department of Biological Sciences. Currently, his research focuses most intensely on the Flat Head Lake, as well on the alpine and subalpine lakes of Western Montana. A specific studies involve observational and experimental work at various scales, including laboratory cultures, a short-term field experiments where he goes into the environment, and whole ecosystem manipulations. He's highly regarded in his field. In 2012, he received the G.A. Hutchinson Award of the Association of Science of Limnology and Oceanography which is the world's largest uh, scientific association dedicated to aquatic sciences. He has also been named Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, as well as a foreign member of the Norwegian Academy of Arts and Sciences. In his recognition for his research accomplishments, in 2019, he was elected the US, uh, into the US National Academy of Sciences. And this is the biggest achievement of any academic can have in the United States. So he's probably one of the handfuls. It's easier to become a university president than being elected on the National Academies. So membership is considered again the highest honor that a scientist can receive and we're delighted that he has accepted to give this talk. I want to thank you very much for supporting Notre Dame Science by coming here today. And I'd like you to welcome Dr. Jim Esther. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Schnell, and thank you all for coming out today. Um, it's going to be a great game, and we're going to get warmed up today with a little phosphorus, and hopefully you'll find that uh, energetic, because we'll see that it's very closely related to a lot of our biological processes that you're running inside your body right now, but you don't know uh, what you're doing about that. So, But to do that, we are going, you already got a little sheet about uh, earlier, so we're going to be using a technology called VoxVote, and hopefully you've already successfully gotten signed up. You can use that QR code uh, anytime you want. 
There's going to be an exciting prize at the end of this um, event. The exciting prize is a copy of my new book about phosphorus. And you say, why, why would I need that anymore? I'm going to learn everything in 45 minutes. But anyway, um, there's a lot more in the book than we'll have a chance to go into today. So if you have a chance to get signed up, you can get signed up uh, and very, uh, along the way here. All right, so, and if you want to win a prize, you've got to put your real name in so we can find out who you were. Um, and you must be present at the end. So no, no sneaking out early to get to the tailgater just yet, okay? All right, so. All right, let's practice. Let's practice our voting system. All right, so if you're signed in, we're gonna, so a question, I'm gonna open a question and you'll be given a, and your phone will change and it'll give you the selection to vote for. So who's gonna win the game tonight is the question. And here, so here I'm gonna open it up and you should get a chance to answer that question. In a blowout, 14 to 20, 3 to 13 win by Notre Dame, a squeaker, we win by one or two, or sadly, you're a North Carolina fan. Which one you want to go for? It's going to cog down there. You see it counting down? Um, so get your answer in. We'll see what the spread is or how it compares to uh, the Vegas odds. Let's see what's happening here. All right, everyone's getting in, I hope. Let's see how many votes we get, what the consensus is. Oh, okay, all right, so we have a pretty strong win coming from the Irish, I would have to agree, and sadly, there are some North Carolina fans here. Hey, it'll be all right. <laughs> it's only football, so uh, in any case. All right, so there we go. So everyone knows how to use that, the technology. We're gonna use it several times. So we're gonna talk about phosphorus today. What is phosphorus? Phosphorus is a chemical element, 15th one in the periodic table. It means it has 15 protons in the nucleus, 15 electrons in its orbitals, uh, et cetera. And it's very, very important for all kinds of reasons that are described uh, in this book. So I'm not gonna really lecture yet, uh, or go really go lecture. Instead, we're gonna have, do this in a form of a quiz because we're at college, right? So we're gonna take a quiz. You say, but I didn't, a quiz? I didn't do the reading yet. And don't worry, my students don't do the reading ahead of time either. <laughs> so, so, so we're gonna take the quiz even though you haven't read the book. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Let's, uh, so we're gonna do this in the form of a quiz. And let's see, the first question I think is the next one here. How much phosphorus do you have in your body right now? Right now, sitting there. I just told you what it is. You just learned what it is, and now you've got to tell us how, how much you have in your body. 0 0.014 pounds. Sorry, I'm going to start with the question up. Here we go, so you can vote. There we go. 0 0.014 pounds, 0.14 pounds, 1.4 pounds, or 14 pounds. How many pounds of phosphorus do you have in your body? Isn't that weird? You just learned about phosphorus is, and now you realize you don't know how much of it you have in your body. Isn't that a little strong? <laughs> Make you feel a little nervous? <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see. All right. 0.14 pounds. Oh, look, it's a tie. That was amazing. Wow. Um, or 1.4 pounds or 14 pounds. That would be a big load of phosphorus, that's for sure. Um, the answer is 1.4 pounds. And where is it? It's mostly in your bones. Your bones are made of a mineral called apatite, A-P-A-T-I-T-E. Not the other apatite. <laughs> it's a mineral, calcium phosphate mineral. And you all know about building, drinking milk for calcium, right? They never talk about the phosphate. You can't make bones without phosphate either, right? Doesn't matter how much calcium you have. You need the phosphate to go along with it to make that mineral. All right, so it's mostly in your bones. It's also in your DNA. Some people say phosphate makes, holds your genes up. But not bum. That's, anyway, all right, so it is. It's in your DNA. What could be more important than that? It's in your RNA as well. So here's a DNA molecule. Here's these ATCs and Gs that you may have heard about, the DNA sequence. There's the phosphate molecule right there. It holds, it's the bridging molecule between these different letters of the, of the DNA alphabet. It's also present in RNA. There it is over there, a very similar molecule. It's also present, this is ATP. This is the energetic cell, uh, molecule of the cell. There's three phosphates in ATP. Um, that's what keeps your uh, energy levels going. Uh, that is the currency of energy. Um, so really important, every organism, every single one needs phosphorus uh, to make, at least make its DNA, also make its RNA, make its ATP. It's completely and totally essential. 
All right, where did your phosphorus come from? Another disturbing thing you may not know. You have a pound and a half of something in your body called phosphorus that you just learned about this morning, apparently. And where did it come from? Where did it come from? Did it come from Arizona? Did it come from Florida? Did it come from Saskatchewan? Or did it come from California? That's weird. I've never been to any of those places. How can my phosphorus come from there? <laughs> All right, let's see how we're doing. Count it down. And again, we're all at Notre Dame here, so honor code. No one's allowed to Google during the quiz. I don't, it goes without saying, but I said it anyway. <laughs> oh, there's the answer. Saskatchewan, or Arizona, or Florida, or Cal, oh my. Uh, Saskatchewan would be the right answer if I asked you where your potassium came from. Uh, because uh, potassium is very important uh, uh, in plant fertilizers, and a lot of it comes from Saskatchewan. The answer is Florida. So you're, um, most of the fertilizer that grows crops, most phosphorus used for fertilizer, it comes from mines in Florida, um, near Tampa, in a place cleverly called Bone Valley. And that region is called Bone Valley. Tampa's over here. So the phosphorus is mined. These are ancient geological deposits. They're millions and millions of years. The remains of a shallow sea that existed hundreds of millions of years ago. Over time, the phosphorus was concentrated. There were remains of organisms, really. And over time, geological processes have transformed them. Uplift of the seafloor has taken place, and now these phosphorus-rich deposits are present at the surface where they can be mined. And so these are the mines operating um, in central Florida. The water table is very shallow there, so when they dig a hole, it fills in with water. Algae blooms, that's why it looks green like that. It's a very interesting process to extract the phosphorus. They treat the phosphate rock, pound it up in a little the powder. They treat it with concentrated sulfuric acid. And the result of that, it produces phosphoric acid, which is then used for, to make the fertilizer. The remains of that is something called phosphogypsum. Enormous quantities of phosphogypsum are formed. That's what you're seeing these big piles of here. This is, uh, contains heavy metals. It contains radionuclides, clean radon. It's not very nice material um, that you want around, and uh, there are concerns about its fate. And you may have uh, noticed in the news this past year there was a big crisis in western Florida because one of these containment ponds for these remains uh, at Piney Point was threatening to fail and flood and contaminate uh, an entire town. All right. So your phosphorus comes from Florida because it's used to make fertilizer, which is put on food that you eat, right? So that's how your phosphorus got from Florida into your bones. All right. So that's your phosphorus. Oops, wrong one. Where will your grandchildren's phosphorus come from? Because, as it turns out, the mines in Florida have about 20 years left of production, maybe 30. Suburbs are growing around them. No one wants the mine to expand any further. So the, those mines in Florida are getting limited. There's other mines in North America, but they're not so large. Um, so did I stop that or did you? <laughs> well, that's interesting. All right, anyway. There's the end. I hope that was your answers. All right, so there's, we got a bunch of answers. A lot of people think it's from Chile, and some people, only 26 of you. Let's start it again. Let's see if that happens. Can anyone, can you vote again? I'm not seeing any more votes come in. All right. Interesting. It's my first public use of this technology, so <laughs> it's been a little bit fraught, but it's working so far. All right, so. All right, so there we go. Uh, a lot of you folks think Chile. Good thought. A lot of fertilizer has historically been traced to Chile, mostly nitrogen fertilizer from old from islands, guano islands and such, were mined for, for nitrate to make explosives and then later using the nitrate to make fertilizer. All right, so what is the answer? The answer is Morocco. Morocco is a very important place for um, fertilizer production, they have, phosph they have, they have the, these deposits as well, these geological deposits as well. There's Morocco on the top, here's the mine itself as it's being developed. There's no ponds, right, there's, it's a Sahara Desert, 
groundwater is very uh, much not existent there, right? So there's no ponds filling up, getting green here. But this is where um, the future phosphorus will likely come because it turns out, as we'll see, Morocco has a lot of phosphorus um, compared to everyone else in the world. So here's the next question I have is, is not, I don't have a quiz for this, but here is an interesting situation. Here's the mine. It's the mine I just showed you. This is the ocean here, and this is the loading dock. So what do we think this is right here? A road? No. What? A railroad? No, it's not a railroad? No. It's the world's longest conveyor belt. 60 miles. 60 mile long conveyor belt takes phosphate rock from that mine to port where it gets uh, transported for production. So this is a piece of the phosphorus supply chain that keeps the world alive. <laughs> That's where it starts. It's an open conveyor belt and it crosses the Sahara Desert. A significant percentage of the world's phosphorus supply moves along that conveyor belt. So if you think about food security, uh, ask yourself if that seems like a safe arrangement. But in any case, that's where uh, your children, grandchildren's phosphorus will come from. All right. You might have to guess for this one, but let's see. By what percentage did the price of phosphate rock spike in 2007? There was a big change in the phosphate rock market. That ha Oops, wrong. Whoops, whoops, whoops. I gave the answer away now. Hopefully you didn't see that. All right, since you're all guessing, I'm going to just cut it short anyway, because it's not like you can figure it out. Let's, let's see how we did it. I said the word big. Yeah, I said the word big, 700%. That is correct. So a lot of you went for that one. That was a good choice. So the price of phosphate rock went up by 700% in 2007, 2008. And you can see it was like being a phosphate rock commodity broker was like the world's most barring job for a while. And then and suddenly the phosphate rock market sort of had a heart attack and we had this amazing increase. And I wrote about it in Foreign Policy Magazine because what I was calling attention to was the possibility that Morocco contains, controls so much phosphate rock, becoming scarce possibly or at least expensive, right? And then that has national security, food security, foreign policy implications, right? About how people secure the food supply for their uh, populations, how governments can do that. So, the pro this rock price has come down a bit and it's bounced around, but even the last time I checked a few couple months ago, it's still four times higher now than it was before that whole thing started. So phosphate rock is becoming uh, more expensive. So here's some data about how much phosphate rock is out there. Um, Morocco has 85% of the global phosphorus reserves. China is next. We have about the fifth largest estimated reserve out there. Um, to give you a relative comparison, the situation we have here, 13 countries in OPEC, right? And they control 75% of global petroleum. One country controls 85% of a non-substitutable resource that's required for, uh, to feed people. So that's a pretty important um, situation, I think. Morocco is a friendly country, generally open to trade. And, uh, and such right now, but uh, in any case, it's a situation that um, is potentially um, um, uh, risky, I would say. All right, all right, do some heavy lifting already. We're gonna take a little break from the heavy science and foreign policy issues. How many people saw Breaking Bad? Yeah, my opinion, greatest television show ever produced, but anyway. Um, there's phosphorus in Breaking Bad. There's a lot of chemistry in it, right? Because Walter White's a chemist, right? In any case, so here we have a little pop culture break. What role did phosphorus play in Breaking Bad? All right. Walter White used it in, ex in explosive to blow out the windows in Tuca Salamanca's lair, caused algae blooms in Walter White's swimming pool, ate through the bathroom floor in Jesse Pinkman's house, it's in the safety matches that guy had in the Home Depot. All right? Now, if you're a Breaking Bad aficionado, this is where you're going to win the book.
Okay, well, our divided opinions, divided opinions on that one. Let's see the answer. The answer is, it was in the safety matches of that guy at the Home Depot. So one form of phosphorus, most phosphorus is the form of phosphate, where there's a phosphorus atom and four oxygen atoms, but you can also have elemental phosphorus molecules that are shown in the bottom, where the phosphorus is directly bonded to other phosphorus molecules. Very unstable chemical situation. You'd have to do it in the hood over there um, <laughs> if you wanted to deal with that stuff. And um, it's used in safety matches. Now, why was that relevant to um, Breaking Bad, it's relevant because phosphorus, elemental phosphorus, is used in making methamphetamine. In fact, it was discovered, it was this process was developed in the late 19th century by a Japanese chemist. And during World War II, Japanese pilots used the uh, methamphetamines to uh, get energized and stay awake and, uh, during um, uh, wartime. And uh, so phosphorus has, has a role in Breaking Bad, as a lot of other interesting chemistry. All right, let's keep going. Now we're going to move to a different side of the phosphorus story. It's going to have to do with uh, what happens to phosphorus when it gets out of um, our hands. The question is, what U.S. city had its drinking water supply shut down by a phosphorus-driven toxic algae bloom in 2014? Flint, Michigan, Toledo, Ohio, Butte, Montana, Orlando, Florida, or Chapel Hill, North Carolina, home of the Tar Heels? Whoops, wrong one. This one is the one I want. Right, let's see. Toledo, Ohio seems to have won, and that is, in fact, the correct answer. Written up in the New York Times, about uh, three or four days, Toledo had no drinking water because uh, the in water intake is in the western end of Lake Erie, and there was a toxic algae bloom going on producing a microcystin molecule, which is a liver toxin. Um, and they were unable to get that out of the water, so they had to shut down the water supply. Increasing story around the world, city of Wuxi in China had lost it. That's five million people. That's a real city, exposed to Toledo, which is a tiny little town compared to Chinese cities. Uh, that, that city lost its, its drinking water for almost two weeks. Five million people. Um, 20% of the lakes in the United States are impacted by phosphorus and nitrogen pollution. It's the number one single cause of water quality degradation around the world. And it comes from all kinds of places. Mostly we've gotten the point sources under control, sewage systems in the developed world. Detergent bans have been implemented. That helped. Uh, phosphate detergent bans. But agricultural phosphorus use is widespread, and a lot of phosphorus is lost from uh, agricultural fields, right, where crops are grown, but also from feedlots and, and uh, dairy operations and where it causes water pollution. All right. So where is this phosphorus coming from? It's coming to support our diets, right? So a dietary footprint is how much phosphorus an individual, the average individual has the average diet in a country, how much phosphorus it takes to grow that, the food in that diet. All right, so now which country has the largest per capita, that is per person, dietary footprint? China, the USA, Luxembourg, or Argentina? Hmm. All right, let's see what everyone thinks. USA seems to have won in this case. What's the answer? The answer is Argentina. We're number two. Dang it. <laughs> no, this is not something you actually want to win, this one, actually. It's not something you really want to win. Uh, Argentina has the largest dietary phosphorus footprint. Why? Because Argentina has the highest per capita consumption of beef in the world, even more than the United States. And beef it takes a lot of phosphorus to produce because you have to grow all the crops to feed to the cows, 
right? And cows have, and livestock, steer, beef, cattle, have a low conversion efficiency. You have to feed them a lot to grow their, those big bodies. And so by far, and these are all the different countries of the world, you can see that the, 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 the plant part of the diet has hardly any contribution to the dietary phosphorus footprint, but meat has the biggest contribution. It causes the variation. The world mean is over here. By the way, China is moving to the left because meat consumption in China is increasing quite a lot in the last couple decades as it becomes more affluent. So in any case, we're not number one. We're number two on that one. And so there's a lot of livestock out there that are being raised, right, for meat and dairy. Right? And there's also poultry, right? They also have need phosphorus, right? And they also excrete phosphorus. So there's a lot of phosphorus out there that's available um, that needs to be put on the system to keep the food system going. All right, now there's a lot of stuff coming out of that livestock, right? So here's a question. If you took all the manure produced by all the livestock in Iowa in a year, put it in a stack and put it in, say, randomly, Michigan Stadium, <laughs> How tall would that stack be? All right? <laughs> Nothing personal. He came from the University of Michigan. Don't hold it against him. All right, so let's see what you think. 480 feet tall, 480 feet tall, 48,000 feet tall, or 480,000 feet tall. All the manure from all the livestock in Iowa in a year, just a year, not in, in history, in a year. All right, let's see what people think. Forty-eight thousand feet seems to be the winner. Oh yes, someone went. No one went for the small one. Forty-eight thousand, four hundred eighty thousand feet. That's in at the edge of space. I think it's like <laughs> Jeff Bezos would have hit that. But anyway, um, anyway, so let's see the answer. The answer is yes, nine miles. Nine miles, 48,000 feet approximately, right? That is a lot of manure. It's a, it's, it would be a hazard to aviation, right? So that's, that, that's just one year. That's just one state, right? In fact, there's another way to look at this. A colleague at the University of Iowa made this map of Iowa. We took all the watersheds in Iowa, looked up all the livestock and such that were being raised there, and then he converted that manure that they produced to human equivalents, because we make poop, they make poop. You can interconvert them, right? And you can see that Iowa livestock produced the waste equivalent to a human population of 168 million people. It's mind-boggling, right? It's mind-boggling. You can see here, this watershed right here has the equivalent population of Tokyo in the middle of Iowa, right? It's pretty wild. It's, it's really pretty wild. And of course, our waste in the developing, developed world, we send to the wastewater treatment plant, right, where it is handled appropriately. The phosphorus is removed, right? Hopefully recycled, we'll talk about that. Livestock manure. Get spread, how much do you, well, that's way too much to spread locally. It can't be spread locally. It has to be piled up somewhere, put in lagoons. A lot of it is lost. It's, a lot of it's causing water pollution um, in Iowa and downstream, including the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico you may have heard about. So it's incredible. So what are we going to do with all this poo, right? We have to do something with it. What we're doing with it now is not working. There's a lot of contamination of our, of our water supplies that's coming from that, so we need to figure out what to do with it. So here's one possibility. We should start recycling it, right, instead of digging it up in Morocco, dragging that across the ocean, right? Why don't we just get some phosphorus we have here, which is damaging our ecosystems, stop it from damaging the ecosystems, and use it as fertilizer. So things that are coming online include anaerobic bioreactors. These are facilities where you can bring the manure in. It goes into a closed fermenter. Microbes operate on that, breaking down the organic matter. They produce methane or hydrogen gas, which could be used to a biofuel, as a biofuel. Some large dairy operations are now running their entire fleets of tractors and other trucks on uh, biofuels that they produce on the farm itself. And the phosphorus and the nitrogen can also be recovered. And for human waste, there's technologies also being implemented. There's a company out there called Astara that we work with who um, put uh, its technology into the 
wastewater treatment plant, and instead of that phosphorus, which is being stripped from the waste, going to the landfill and being lost, um, it produces a slow-release fertilizer um, from that process. They call it crystal green. All right, so that's one thing that's going on. So we need to start recycling this manure. So to get it back and make a circle, make a cycle instead of a line, right, from mine to farm to water. We don't want that. We want, we want food to waste to food, or we want to do that, right? That's the system we want to start building um, that, that can last indefinitely. All right, so we also have to start maybe reducing the amount of manure that we produce, how much food, how much animal production. There's lots of discussion of that, how to do that, people changing their diets, adopting um, a vegetarian lifestyle, for example. But there's something even more radical going on with that. I don't know if you've heard about it. Oh, and so let's, yeah, so here's my question. How much would you have had to pay for the first stem cell hamburger. So a stem cell is a biological technology. You take an undifferentiated cell of some tissue type like muscle, induce it to, to reproduce, and you can grow that tissue in a Petri dish or a vat or, or wherever, right? So if you take a stem cell of muscle tissue from uh, cattle, from a cow, and put it in a system, you can grow muscle fibers of, of cattle, which is meat, right? And so this is now being developed. So how much would you have to have paid for the first hamburger produced by this technology? A quarter pounder, let's say. Well, okay, $300,000 is the winning uh, answer here. Let's see what the actual answer is. The actual answer is $300,000. That first burger would have cost you $300,000 because it was, had to be grown essentially in a laboratory by like a team of like 20 PhD chemists and biologists. It was invested, there's the investment of Sergey Brin, who's the founder of Google, who started this, uh, re this work. It took him about 10 years to produce that, um, that burger, and it cost $300,000 if you add up all the costs to get to that point. It's getting a lot better. In 2018, I saw a report that the price of that same burger would be $300 and uh, it would be $10. So it's starting to approach something that is competitive, right? The company that's now commercializing that's called Moza Meat. There's a lot of stem cell developments now in this sector going on. They're listed, some of them are listed down here, Memphis Meats, Fork and Good. They're starting to make stem cell seafood um, to replace uh, wild caught um, seafood. Here's another one uh, as well. This is a whole new industry that's being born right now. Um, and I expect you'll start to see this kind of product in the grocery store, I think within five years. Um, but that's just a speculation. Okay. All right, we're going to start uh, wrapping the quiz, well, most of the quiz part up. So, and here's another one. Henning Brand is a very interesting person in the story of phosphorus because he was the first to discover it, which means, really means to say he didn't really know what he had, but he was the first to purify pure elemental phosphorus. This was the first actual chemical element ever purified um, by chemical means. And he did that because he was an alchemist. He was searching for the philosopher's stone which was legendary, right? That would give it a secret to eternal life, et cetera. So in 2019, we celebrated the 350th anniversary of this event. And um, there he is gazing at or kneeling before the glowing. This is the dawn of the enlightenment, right? This is a, as the scientific revolution gets started, um, kneeling before the glowing flask. Um, and so the question is, where did he get the phosphorus that he purified? From what material? Chicken manure, animal bones, human urine, phosphorus-rich rocks, or lake sediments? All right. 
right, let's see what people think. Okay, seem people think to have urine on their minds today. All right, so let's see what the actual answer is. Believe it or not, he discovered phosphorus while attempting to distill urine into gold. There's a recipe for this, you can read it online. I've seen on YouTube people trying to re reproduce this process. It's quite disgusting, actually. Um, you need specialized equipment, actually, to make it work. But in any case, it's true. Um, that is what he used, a urine from beer drinking German soldiers. Brought it in by barrels and horses and stuff and, um, and put it through this process. And some of you will be initiating a similar process later today. Um, but in any case, I actually have a colleague who's working on urine recapture of phosphorus, actually, and he's actually tested this type of um, apparatus where we can start to collect, separate urine before it goes into the regular septic uh, system to be able to uh, recover phosphorus for, from it. All right, so urine, it all comes down to it. All right. So I'm here to tell you that we, what we read, need right now in the phosphorus world is what I would call it a new alchemy. So alchemy is taking a base uh, material, right, something worthless, and turning it into something precious like gold, right? That's what alchemy was all about. So uh, we know alchemy doesn't work now in modern science, but there are ways that we can do something similar. You know, maybe we can take wastes and turn them into resources, right? Maybe we can take things that seem scarce to us, like phosphorus maybe becoming scarce and make it abundant. Maybe we can turn dead zones of the environment into return their productivity. Maybe we can take hunger and conflict and concern about our future um, water and food supply and turn them into a secure situation for humanity. So that's what um, I'll be talking about now. What, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do, this little kid is asking. And so maybe re, the three R's, we all know about the three R's, right? Reduce, reuse, recycle. And I say this problem was too big for three R's. We're gonna need five. Five R's are gonna be needed for this problem. What are they? I'm a scientist, so one of the first things we need to do is more research. <laughs> Science is always like having more research, right? So we need, but we need research in all kinds of areas, right? Not just in agriculture, for example. We need it all across um, in different disciplines of science, and especially as we start to figure out how to make these things real in the world, we need to solve the economic challenges associated with them. We need to find out the political structures that allow us to implement them um, uh, justly and fairly around the world or in whatever society we're talking about. So research is gonna be needed. I'll talk a little bit about that coming up. Reduce, we need to reduce a lot of things. One of the main ways we lose phosphorus from the food system is through erosion, soil erosion, big problem in all kinds of areas. Soil's a precious resource. And um, a lot of agricultural practices um, lead to soil erosion, so we need to do a better job there as well. That's challenging, because we've been working on soil erosion for a while, and we haven't uh, necessarily solved it. We need to reduce food waste. 30% of all the food in the world is wasted before it's eaten. And that's in the developing world and in the developed world. In the developing world, it's lost up the food, up the supply chain at the field or in storage. In our system, in the developed world, it's lost in the household and at restaurants and, and at the consumption stage. Um, so food waste is a big deal. That's wasted fertilizer, right? If we didn't waste that food, we wouldn't have to use phosphorus to produce it, right? So we need to reduce Food waste. We need to reduce demand. So one source of demand is, of course, human population itself. These are the human population forecasts for 2050 on there. We might have 11 billion people, 9 billion people, or 7 billion people in 2050, depending on what happens demographically in the future. And those trajectories are determined by, very, can be determined by very just things, like empowering women with education, and, uh, and financial opportunities so they have more control over their, uh, over their situation. So that's gonna be part of the demand, but not just how many people, of course, as we saw earlier, how much each person uses, right, in its diet, the intensity, the phosphorus intensity or footprint of the diet, right, as we talked about with respect to meat consumption, we've estimated about one third of the increase of phosphorus demand that has been observed in the last 50 years is due to changing diet alone irregardless of population size. 
people are eating more meat. It happens naturally as populations become more affluent. That's what's going on in China right now. They're putting more meat in their diet because they're more affluent. That's great. But it has these other implications that um, we need to deal with. So here's a little clue about phosphorus footprint and how that happens. So different types of meat have different phosphorus footprints. So beef is the highest phosphorus footprint, again, because it takes a lot of feed to produce a given amount of meat or mass on um, beef cattle there. So that footprint is larger than it is for pigs and swine and pork, which is larger than it is for poultry, which is larger than the phosphorus footprints uh, for um, fish production. So the further the situation is on the right of this graph, the less phosphorus is needed to produce that diet. Recycle. We need to start recycling. Right now we dig it up somewhere in Morocco and Florida. We sprinkle it on our fields. We grab the crops. Some of it's lost over there. We feed the crops to ourselves or to our food. Then the phosphorus goes over there, right? And then it goes into the lakes and the oceans, right? And causes these problems. This is the conveyor belt of phosphorus. We need a cycle. We need a circular economy for phosphorus. And so there's ways and technologies to recycle the phosphorus. And I introduced you to some of them. Um, today, these technologies need to be advanced and um, implemented. We need to rethink a lot of things that we're doing in the food system or in the agricultural sector or in the urban sector. We need to redesign our cities, possibly, for how they move food and phosphorus around. Um, we need to rethink what we do in agriculture and waste, how we handle waste, for example. Another thing I'd like to say is bioenergy. In 2010, 10% of all the phosphorus fertilizer in the United States was used to produce corn ethanol, which was then put in a tank and burned up. And my personal opinion is that fertilizer and phosphorus is so important, it should only be used to, to grow food. It should not be used to grow uh, bioenergy crops or other sorts of things that are not used to feed people. Um, because of the essential role that that uh, phosphorus has. So maybe this is going to happen as the transport sector gets electrified in the next decade or two. Um, that'll start to go away. But in any case, that's the one um, big draw of fertilizer that's not feeding people at all. All right, so those are some nice R's. What are people actually doing about it? Are things happening? Are things moving in the ground? So I'm just going to talk a little bit about things we're doing here at Notre Dame. And uh, they're working on this. I don't know if you saw this during halftime a couple of years ago. Here's Dr. Jennifer Tank at, uh, in the Environmental Change Initiative, colleague of mine. And she's fighting for clean water. She has some amazing research that she does on studying processes and practices that can be implemented in farm fields to keep phosphorus loss uh, from occurring. And so she's a terrific um, example of some of the work that's going on to improve things. It was mentioned I run something called the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance at Arizona State University. This is a member's organization of practitioners, companies, industrial representatives, agricultural uh, interests, fertilizer companies, all coming together to sort of coordinate, con uh, exchange information, and promote more innovative ways of working uh, in the phosphorus system. I'm excited to tell you that just recently a big new initiative was funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation that I'm involved in. A science and technology center has been created around the theme of phosphorus sustainability. These are a really big deal. It involves a $25 million grant that will be spent over five years and then a renewal of that, an additional $5 million. And we're going to be working on many, many dimensions of the problem I talked to you about today. Um, it's centered at North Carolina State University and also at Arizona State where I work um, and a bunch of other uh, places around the country have investigators involved. And so I'm hoping that we're going to have some real breakthroughs and approaches and strategies here uh, on phosphorus sustainability that will come about in the next decade from this effort. All right, what can you do to help? Now let's talk about your role in this because everyone has responsibility as you live in the world. Right? And you take things and you, and you return things to the world, and we have to um, be mindful of that. So the first thing you can do is consider your diet. Less meat, less phosphorus intensive meat. I'm not a vegetarian myself, but I do try to reduce the amount of meat and eat less beef because it is the most phosphorus intensive and has the highest greenhouse gas footprint, all the other impacts. So meat is, is that. Do you really need that lawn? People put fertilizer in the lawn. How about, isn't it kind of a pain to mow it all the time? 
Maybe make it smaller. <laughs> Think about it at least, okay? Um, reduce your food waste, only buy what you need. Try to make the most of what you have, eat your leftovers, all that kind of thing, you know? Um, maintain your septic system. If you aren't a septic system, make sure it's properly maintained to keep uh, that phosphorus uh, from going where it's not supposed to go. If there's anyone innovating in your town or locality around nutrient recovery, you should cheer them on and encourage them if you're in a position of power to influence uh, wastewater treatment or other approaches in your uh, area, then you should do that. And generally, um, I would say that we need to move nutrient management higher in our uh, consciousness, and that's the reason I'm giving this lecture and I wrote this book, um, so that we can uh, have clean water in the future, so we can have food security in the future, and we can also mitigate climate change, because phosphorus, as it turns out, I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, draw, is a major driver of climate change, because phosphorus going into lakes makes lakes emit methane and carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And it's not a trivial source, it's actually quite a, a, a non, it's an important source. So, that's what you can do to help. What are the big points today I made? Um, Hope you've learned that phosphorus is a chemical element essential to all life. It's scarce in the environment, but it's essential for food production and fertilizers. It's mined from finite ancient deposits were found in just a few countries right, around the world. Furthermore, loss of phosphorus from the food system is a major driver of water pollution uh, in many, many places around the world, including here in the United States. So to protect water quality and assure our future food production, we need to be more efficient in how we use fertilizers uh, in food production. We need to use less fertil food, uh, fertilizer overall by reducing food waste and by shortening the food chain um, by less meat consumption. And then we need to develop and innovate to make new technologies um, for recycling um, phosphorus from these uh, waste that I've been talking about. So those are the big takeaways I'd like to leave you with. All right, so now the next quiz question is how much you would you be willing to pay for a book that has all this incredible information in it? So, uh, yeah, so anyway, I guess I should have had this poll before they set the price of the book, right? We could have determined the market price before we started selling it, but in any case, um, <laughs> Anyway, how much would you pay for this incredible book with all these facts in it and fascinating perspectives? Let's see. All right. I really hope no one says $3. That's going to be embarrassing. Everyone's <laughs> <laughs> changing their vote right now. Hey, oh, God, no, that's so sad. It's my roommates over there did that. I'm sure it was them. All right. Whoever said $3,000, I'd like you to line up right over here, because I have three copies. The prices are gone now. I'm going to just sell them over here. Anyway, no, it does cost $30 on, on Amazon. Um, yeah, so thanks for that. Um, all right, so who won? Now you want to know who won. I'm going to have some more words to uh, say after this, but I do want to see who won, because that was the last quiz, question of the quiz. So let's see how this goes here. Kevin Buck. Kevin Buck? There you are, all right, and Dennis Albiani. Where's Dennis Albiani? All right, over there. Okay, great, so come on up after. Who's that, the blank person? All right, I'm gonna go down, I think I can see the third score here. Monica, that's my wife, you cannot, you cannot, uh, I'm not gonna give it there. Kate, who's Kate? All right, Kate, you, uh, you get the third price. And this is my college old roommate, Joe Babington. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. <laughs> anyway, all right, so come on up afterwards and we will, um, now, how do I get back? That's the question. Maybe I do this. Oop, oh, that one didn't want to do that. Crap. Okay. Hmm. Let's go. Interim score. That's this one. Let's try this one. Okay. All right. We're gonna have to run through all of them now. Hold on. Oh, you can take a memory lap through the delightful journey we've had today. Remember when we were talking about bones? That was a nice moment, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. I can go there. Good idea. There. Oh, smart. That's not too... My labeling system's not very uh, informative. Let me go here. All right, and we're a little further up. Let's go a little further down. There we go. All right, a little further down than that. <laughs> yeah, okay, here we go. 
and we're almost done. All right, next one. All right, we found out who won. All right, so I want to thank you, of course, for coming today. And um, here, let me get back to full screen view here. Hold on. There we go. All right, so I have, I have a few more things I want to close with. So I've been featuring this little kid. Um, I found this picture a while ago, and I liked it because, uh, to, way, to me, what it is, this is a kid of the future. And, he's, and he or she has ripped a hole in the space-time continuum. <laughs> and, and they're looking at us now, living now, and, they, and he's saying, what are you people doing with my phosphorus? <laughs> right? Or he could be saying, what are you doing with my climate? Right? The children of the future don't exist yet, but they're nevertheless real. They will exist, right? And they have rights. They have a right to live in a safe and healthy environment with clean water, abundant food, and a stable climate. We owe that to them, right? So that's what I think about when I think about this kid. It's a kid of the future who has the right to inhabit a world that is clean and can support healthy uh, uh, lifestyle for people and nature. Um, and we owe that to, to that person to produce that world. So my final thought is uh, one that came from a really famous oceanographer, his name was Walt, Walter Monk, and he died at the age of 112 a couple of years ago, an amazing lifespan, and a super amazing person. And he was involved in the scientific discussions that led up to Pope Francis's uh, encyclical on climate change. And he gave this advice about climate change, but I would say that the same advice can be used um, to, to, to counsel us as we think about what we need to do about the future of phosphorus and, and, he, and what, is it, what is it going to take to get there. And, 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 and what he said was, this requires a miracle of love and unselfishness. So we have to detach our own local and immediate interests, right, and, and count for the rights of the future, right, the children who will exist, who we will never meet, but who nevertheless we have obligations to. And so phosphorus is just one dimension of our obligations of what we have to do to make that happen. Um, and I hope that um, you've, you can carry that message uh, forward. And I just want to thank you very much and hope we have a chance for questions and conversation. So thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. On the scale from Left being beef, or right being else. Where do these so-called fake things like Beyond Burgers? Yeah, Beyond Burgers are a new thing, Impossible Burger. They are an innovation. They're most they're plant-based. They're plant-based, but what they've done is that they've uh, genetically engineered um, a protein, a heme protein, um, into the plant, and that heme protein is what gives meat its meaty flavor especially after cooking. It gives it the umami flavor that, we, that people like in meat. And so that's what the Impossible Burger has in it. So it's a plant-based product that has, um, that has this heme protein in there, and therefore it has a more realistic meat-like flavor. They would be way over on the left. Uh, way over, no, way over on this side, on the low phosphor side of the equation, because it's mostly a plant product. Probably has a pretty decent carbon signature because doing all that work, but I think in the long run it's going to be um, a good product. I've had those things; are pretty good, actually. They're not bad. I had Impossible Burger lasagna last week, in fact. Back there, sir. What would happen to crops if we try to either totally reduce or very strongly reduce the amount of phosphate? Would be just a really poor crop or just impossible? What would happen if we stopped using phosphorus so much, or? Yeah, so that's a great question. A lot of people are doing that experiment. In many cases, not much happens for a while because there's a lot of phosphorus that's built up in the soil. Some of it's not available immediately. It's not easily available. But in many cases, there's no reduction in yield for a few years. But after a while, if you keep harvesting that crop, you're taking phosphorus away when you harvest the crop. So you have to put something back. But the, people do that experiment, and it can, it's amazing, actually. Sometimes you could go for a few years, and you don't get a reduction in yield, even if you don't fertilize. But we don't have a good sense of how common that situation is or where um, 
it would be appropriate to do that. You would think it would be in the farmer's interest to do it, right? Is I don't have to pay fertilizer this year, I should just not add it. So, but it turns out eventually you have to. Like we want to, you know, I would love it to be stand up and say we could have an organic, high diversity, you know, low uh, impact agriculture, you know, farm to table kind of a thing. You can't feed millions and billions of people that way, unfortunately. It's too, we need to do better with how we grow and what we grow and whether it goes to people or not. But um, to feed this many people and keep them healthy, we need high yield agriculture. And it's just, it's sort of naive not to think that. So we just have to figure out a way that's better in terms of how we use fertilizer, how the, what crops are out there. They can do, the crops that we had seen in the book, crops are kind of stupid. Right now, the ones that we have, we call them fast-growing lazy plants in the book. We've, we've bred them very successfully for high yield. Tremendous, but they're very dependent on fertilizer. They're very dependent on fertilizer. They're not very smart at getting fertilizer, getting phosphorus out of different chemical pools in the soil. Wild plants are tremendously clever and efficient at getting soil, phosphorus out of soil. So if we get that intelligence back in our crop plants, we would probably get by with using a lot less fertilizer. Yes? So if we need phosphorus for our bodies and we eliminate it from our diet, where do we get it from? Because obviously we No, you cannot eliminate, you would never want to eliminate phosphorus from your diet. You need one, the minimum recommended requirement is 1.5 grams per day. So you can't not, you can't stop consuming phosphorus. We always need it. Because you're always excreting it. If you don't eat it, you'll get various disorders, in fact, that are written about in the book, uh, with, with, when we have insufficient phosphorus in your diet. There's various... So, like, I mean, many years ago, before we were putting phosphorus, I mean, you know, how were they getting their phosphorus? They were getting phosphorus from what they ate. They just didn't have 7 billion people being... We have now, we have a gigantic right. agricultural system. They had a smaller agricultural system. They got their phosphorus from their food the same way we do. So it, it grows and occurs naturally in plants. Is that what you're saying? Of course. Okay. Yes, we put the fertilizer in the soil. That's right. Put the fertilizer in the soil. The plants take it up into the leaves, into the seeds, into no, the fruit. Even before you fertilize. We weren't always fertilizing. I mean, it's beginning Even before our fertilizing, yes. There was, they used manure. They used their own manure. They did. They, we, yeah, so, right. In the past, before industrial fertilizers, people used manure to fertilize. But again, natural soil, like in a forest or a grassland, there's phosphorus. It's called weathering. It comes out of the rocks naturally at a very slow rate. If we had to rely on natural weathering for our food system, we could never feed 7 billion people. It's too slow. You can think of phosphorus mining as really speeding up by many orders of magnitude the phosphorus cycle. We've just put it into high gear by scraping out these deposits and putting them into the system. Yes, sir. So in years ago, when everything was more self-sustaining farming, you were farming just to survive, you know, so there was population. So was the rate of breakdown of unavailable phosphorus to available for plants to use? It, it, did that occur naturally in the soils at a fast enough pace because there were not Yeah, well, that's a great question. So I'm not sure it's all about available soil and things in the previous agricultural systems. Would that operate faster? Traditional agriculture before large scale agriculture, like industrial agriculture like we have now, was mixed agriculture. You had mixtures of crops. You had livestock rearing going on. People had their, their dairy operation on the farm, et cetera. And the manure was all, it was all sort of cycled at the scale of the farm, right? And that more or less is the way things went for probably centuries, right? Um, now what's happened, of course, all of the pigs are in North Carolina, right? All of the chickens are in Arkansas, right? Or a lot of the pigs are in Iowa as well, right? So we've concentrated the livestock in particular areas of the country because it's much more efficient to do it that way. It's cheaper to do it that way, right? And now, the, all that manure is disconnected from crop agriculture, from production agriculture. You can't take manure from North Carolina and bring it to Montana to fertilize the wheat fields. It's too far. You can only move manure about two kilometers or three kilometers before the gas cost of the fertilizer value of that is exceeded. It's too heavy, which is why you need technologies, like I mentioned, these anaerobic bioreactors, which can make a more purified fertilizer, which is lighter and easier to transport. 
I'm going to go over there. Sure. So the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, does that have excess phosphorus in it? Both. They'll okay. usually talk about nitrogen when they talk about the dead zone. Nitrogen is also a product of fertilizer use. And so it's nitrogen and phosphorus coming in. Algae need those and, and grow and make blooms. Is there any research on mining the excess phosphorus from the dead zone in a way that it can be transported and used in agriculture? Yes, so the question there is about can we take the phosphorus that is like built up at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, at the bottom of these dead zones, or in a eutrophic lake, or whatever. People are looking at that. Actually, this project has some people who are interested in that aspect. My personal feeling is that is too late. You want to get the phosphorus before it gets there, because it's always already wrecked your, your aquatic ecosystem. All right? You want, well, if it's at the bottom of the lake, oftentimes, or the ocean, it can stay there. It's buried. So digging it out itself is risky. You're going to mobilize it again, right? So a lot of the stuff that's at the bottom is out of the system now. Now, you might want to get it back because you don't want to buy phosphate rock from Morocco. It might be a strategy you have for that. But for me, it's sort of like leave it alone on the bottom of the lake or the ocean. Don't touch it. <laughs> just don't let it, let's stop letting it get there in the first place. Because if you just say, oh, let's just get it back over here, it's already ruined your lake or, the, uh, or your marine system on its way through. So you want to keep it from getting there in the first place. Yes, sir. In regards to agricultural methods, is there a cost efficient, more practical way to fertilize such that most of what you're adding is up to I'm not, I'm not close enough to hear you. Go ahead. Is there a way agriculturally to make sure that when you're fertilizing, a lot of phosphorus you're adding is being used in uh, like plant and crop production instead of just running off and you can find this and stuff? Well, that's the idea. The idea is you want to add the fertilizer and have the plants use it. Instead of having it run off. Instead of having it left behind or running off before the plants use it or after they're left, they're taken away, right? So that's the problem, is that something like, I don't know what the numbers are, it depends on what study you look like, look at a third or a fifth of the phosphorus that's added as fertilizer is actually taken up by the crop and the rest is left behind. Where it builds up, a lot of it builds up in the soil, we're accumulating a lot of soil in the United States, uh, phosphorus in the soil in the United States over the last several decades, but a lot of that also is lost. Yes, sir. Uh, the new administration is very interested in doing some of our climate policy and some of our goals with regards to tariff supports and stuff. Have they come out and supported any of the initiatives for like phosphorus things that you were supporting earlier? Like okay, so the question is, has the new administration indicated any interest in addressing these kind of issues? As I've said pub a couple points that I will consider my job complete in raising awareness about phosphorus sustainability next time a US president says the word phosphorus. <laughs> because the US president has said the word phosphorus before. It was F.D. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That was the last time. Because you can search all the speeches of every president, right, online, right? And you can look for phosphorus. The last time a US president said the word phosphorus was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was talking about phosphorus being essential for the security of America. That's when the, International, the Fertilizer Development Center is being set up in the southeast in Tennessee, I believe, and some of this uh, fertilizer technologies were first being developed. Since then, phosphorus is just this weird thing that crazy people like me are interested in. It doesn't rise to the awareness level, but as I've been saying, it's essential for our food security in the future. It's essential for our protecting our water supply. And um, as I said, um, Phosphorus runoff is a major driver of climate greenhouse gas emissions, so we have to get our phosphorus um, in order in order to get our greenhouse gas budgets uh, in order. So, I'll go there. Uh, you're talking about reducing and reusing. Where do you stand on composting? Is that any part of? Composting is a good thing. It's not that scalable. Ultimately, like crop waste re uh, recycling, that happens at the farm scale. It's, it had, farmers do it right all the time. They put the cuttings back on the land. It's a form of composting. Urban composting happens. Yep. So in San Francisco, for example, you can have a good urban composting program. I think it's a good thing. Again, it's not at the scale. It's just like, where, like you know, why do you ride banks? Because that's where the money is, right? Why do you talk about manure all the time? Because that's where the phosphorus is. Ultimately, the big phosphorus pools and 
fluxes and flows are out there in, on the field in, in large-scale agricultural production and large-scale animal operations. That's where the phosphorus is. Composting is great as I think it solves landfill problems and challenges that cities have um, and uh, other issues, but it's not necessarily a, uh, of the scale that's needed to solve this particular problem. I'm gonna go over there and then maybe we'll let people start drinking beer. Okay, I need a beer. <laughs> They'll go there and then there. We'll go behind you first. So okay. my question is, if you uh, want to do something on a small scale, are you better off uh, going to a small family farm in your area where they raise the beef or their grass and they fertilize and all that? It, does that help? Does it help to, to go to the local farm scale system? Well, yes and no, because you can see different analyses of that. One thing that large scale farms do is that they're very efficient. Per calorie, they, they are very efficient in the resources that they use to produce per calorie of food. And that's because of they've invested in capital, uh, they make capital investments in farm equipment and all those sorts of things. And they're, very, they're also very skillful. Um, and so large scale farming is actually very efficient. So in some measures, you're gonna have a hard time beating them on some measures if you go to your local regional, you know, farmer out in the countryside. On the other hand, that farmer, maybe they're probably using less pesticides, so that's a good thing, or maybe, and then they also transport costs, the carbon footprint of moving um, that food around is obviously lower, um, but not, you know, but if everyone in the city takes their, drives their Suburban out to the countryside to buy two tomatoes, how efficient is that? Right? That's not very efficient, right? So, you know, in a lot of ways, it doesn't always work the way you, you think it does. But yeah, so we, I think we have the sense that if we support our family, the local farmers, and we should, there's for all kinds of reasons, um, doesn't necessarily give you the kinds of uh, bang for your buck that you might think it does. Yes, sir. Well, and this, we'll do this the last one so everyone can get out of here. Are the people in organizations like the Phosphorus Alliance, et cetera, who have not had high school chemistry and make the mistake that a lot of carbon lectures that I've heard, they don't know the difference between a ton of carbon and a ton of carbon dioxide. Oh, oh, yeah. A third of carbon dioxide is carbon. See, yeah, so the question is about uh, do, do people know enough about, well, I, I, about phosphorus and chemistry and how to deal with those. Um, expressing phosphorus in terms of tons of, I guess, phosphorus or phosphate, right? You could have, actually the big problem trip up in our field is PTO5, which is the way the geologists express the amount of phosphorus in geological mining. So as someone says, someone used X number of million metric tons of phosphorus, was that PTO5 or phosphorus? And it can cause confusion. So um, I, don't, I haven't encountered that problem too much among, I'm happy if people know that phosphorus exists. <laughs> that's my, that's my, that's a, a very low hurdle I've sent, I've set for myself. So if Leo Phosphorus exists and then everything after that is great. So I want to just warmly thank you again and great having the time. Goodbye. Come on up if you want a book. <laughs>